Ladies and gentlemen, hello at the DAI for Literature. I'm very happy to welcome you here on this summer afternoon to attend the reading of Juan, Juan Gabriel Vasquez, who is connected with us from Berlin. Hello, Juan Gabriel Vasquez, in your flat in Berlin. Very nice to have hello, you with Yuta. us today. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for having me. So, great pleasure for us. Um, to our audience, I'd like to apologize first because we had to, to switch this reading uh, rather short term uh, to the online world. This was due to a number of reasons. Um, we hope to make up uh, for this uh, with one of the next books uh, Juan Gabriel will present to the world. But first of all, we're happy to welcome you now. The work of Juan Gabriel Vasquez is manifold. Not only does he write novels and stories, he also published literary, um, literary essays and virtually hundreds of political commentaries, especially for the Colombian magazine Espectador. And he translated Victor Hugo, John Das Passas, Ian Forster, to name simply a few. Among the prizes he received is the International Dublin Literary Award and the Alfaguara Novel Prize. And this is one of the most significant prizes for literature in the Spanish-speaking world. Juan Gabriel Vasquez studied law in Bogota, Latin American literature at the Sorbonne in Paris. And apart from these two cities, um, he lived in Brussels and in, in Belgium and for many years also in Barcelona. Um, at the moment, he's back uh, in Bogota and he moved back there um, about 10 years ago. Currently, cu currently, however, he lives and works in Berlin. We come back to that later. Today, he will present his new collection of stories, and I say this in three languages now because um, we will read parts to you in German, and of course, the original is English, uh, Spanish, sorry, this must be the heat we've got today. Um, and um, for the people who are only understanding um, English, we can also say the English title, and this is Songs for the Flames in the English translation, Canciones para el Incendio in the original, and Lieder für die Feuerspunst in the German version. They are stories that reflect on past and present, on violence, on turning points in life, and on perspective and perception. And now again, very happy to welcome you here, Juan Gabriel Vasquez at the DAI. Thank you very much. So after 17 years of novels, of various novels you published, this is the first collection of stories uh, we are talking about today. Um, you had uh, the, the first collection you published was, uh, and I say that again in three languages, Los Amantes de Todos los Santos, The All Saints Day Lovers, and in German, Die Liebenden von Allerheiligen. What has made you come back to this more condensed literary genre? Yes, thank you. Well, I, I, you know, I've always, um, in the Latin American tradition, uh, we've always taken the short story very seriously. It's, um, I think, probably with the uh, with North American literature, uh, mainly in the United States, but also in Canada. You have only to think about Alice Munro, who's one of my favorite short story writers. Um, and probably the other case would be Ireland, uh, where for some reason you get extraordinary short story writers all the time. These are traditions in which the short story is uh, read with respect. And um, as in the case of Borges, for instance, Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentinian writer, you are able to make a whole oeuvre um, only with short stories, right? You are able to build um, a reputation and uh, a lifelong work on the genre of the short story. In the Latin American tradition, there are very few important writers that haven't written at least one book of short stories. In the case of Garcia Marquez, there are at least um, three. Vargas Llosa published one. Carlos Fuentes published uh, many short stories. Julio Cortázar, the great Argentinian writer, made his reputation with short stories. So it's it's a genre we love. It it does some things that are very special that novels cannot do, and this is mainly the um, the objective when we sit when we sit down to write. 
It's to try to capture an emotion or a revelation or a human situation that cannot be captured with a novel. And this is what happened to me. I published my first book of short stories in 2001, Los Amantes de Todos los Santos, The Old Saints Day Lovers, the one you have just mentioned. Um, and for the next 17 years, I tried to learn how to write novels. But after 17 years trying to work on that, um, the, my last novel was called The Shape of the Ruins, La Forma de las Ruinas. After that, I felt I needed a change of, uh, of lenses, so to speak, you know, to go back to the, to the short story as a way of looking at the world after trying to look at the world with novels. Um, why? Because the short story is able, as I was saying, to capture a certain kind of human experience that the novel is unable to capture. Mm. And um, with that in mind, I, uh, I took four of the short stories that I had written in previous years, which dealt with the same subjects, violence, as you have said, Utah, violence and the past and the weight of the past. Um, uh, and I wrote five new stories to establish a kind of system, a, a book in which stories talk with each other. Um, there's a dialogue between the stories in this book so that for you, the readers, the experience is almost like, this is one of my favorite um, quotes uh, from a writer that I love, Tobias Wolf, an American short story writer. He said, short story books should be like novels in which characters don't know each other. And this is the experience that I want you to have as readers, to be reading a book that reads like a novel, uh, in a way, if you read it in order, um, but it's made of short stories. So it's almost like a novel in which characters don't know each other. And uh, the result of all those, um, all those years and the new stories is uh, Songs for the Flames. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, what becomes very magic about your stories then uh, is that um, actually one could dive much more deeply in each of the characters. And as you said, it's a completely different uh, experience than reading a novel, but you have this yes. almost magical and mis mis mysterious background um, and have like a um, horizon behind which you see connections evolving between the, the various characters and in, in their stories and biographies. Very beautiful yes. to read. And additionally, in your stories being in dialogue with each other. Um, yes, yes. For our um, listeners, uh, we will read uh, one of your stories in total, split into two parts. Uh, it is the, the story we. But before we start with it, um, I just like to ask uh, one other, other question on your bi biography, because Colombia, of course, plays a major role, the history of Colombia in your, in your stories. And uh, just to have your view briefly on this, because you lived and worked in Europe for almost 20 years, as I said, among other cities in Paris and in Barcelona, also with your families and your daughters, um, if I rem remember correctly, spent uh, most of their childhood in Barcelona, part of their childhood, at least in Barcelona. And yes. in 2012, you moved back to Bogota. Um, years before the peace talks started and there was still uh, the civil war going on and the war on drugs going on. Uh, now you moved from a say rather peaceful uh, Barcelona and we know the conflicts that are going on in Barcelona also uh, to a completely different background in, in Bogota again. And I was wondering um, in what way this political cons uh, context was an influence for the new stories uh, because they deal with fear and truth and also sincerity and memories. Also with a question how a single incident can change a life completely. So what, was it a direct influence or did it just work in a kind of more indirect way into your stories? Yes, 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 that's, that's a very good question. Um, as, as I was saying, the basis of the book is four stories that I had written between uh, 2001, when I published my first book, um, 
and the moment in which I decided to complete a second book of stories. So these were stories that I wrote in Barcelona before going back to Colombia in 2012. When I arrived in Colombia in 2012, uh, the peace negotiations were just beginning. Um, I realized from the first moment that they would be very difficult, very complicated, uh, that they would divide the country, but that they merited our support. Um, and from the first moment, I've tried to write in support of the peace negotiations and in support of the peace agreements, even if they are fallible and complicated and, um, and uh, have left many people feeling unhappy. But as I always say, uh, a true peace agreement is uh, an agreement in which nobody is happy. Um, if somebody is completely satisfied with an agreement, that means it's a bad agreement. Um, for obvious reasons, you have to, you have to make uh, concessions. Uh, you have to renounce things. You have to accept things that you don't necessarily like in order to reach an agreement in a, in a society in conflict. Um, all this to say that while I was writing about uh, the negotiations and trying to support them, um, I was also looking at people, at people who were uh, living under difficult conditions, um, suffering because of them, um, living through different kinds of violence that are very much alive in a society in conflict such as mine. And this, of course, seeped into my fiction. Um, I was writing novels that tried to think about how violence uh, changes our lives. Uh, the Shape of the Ruins is uh, one such novel. And the last, the, the one that I have just published called in Spanish, Volver la Vista Atrás. It will probably come out in German as retrospective or the equivalent German title. Um, these novels try to think about violence, um, but the short stories were doing the same thing. The, the new short stories that I was writing tried to uh, meditate on the difficulty of uh, making sense, really, of 50 years of war that we have lived as Colombians. And this is what happens in the title story, for instance, um, Songs for the Flames, Canciones para el Incendio. It's a story that tries to make sense of many years of violence that we have experienced. Also the first story called in English, Woman in the Riverbank, in Spanish, Mujer en la Orilla. Um, it's a story that uh, tries to uh, explore a certain feeling that we have or that we have had in my country in the last years um, that comes from the fact of living in a place in which uh, war has shaped our lives for the last 50 years. So what happens to human beings when uh, war and uh, you know a kind of endemic violence is present the whole time and is shaping your lives. This is one of the questions the stories tried to ask. There's another story called The Boys, which is kind of a metaphor of my generation. It's a story told um, uh, from the point of view of teenagers uh, growing up in the 80s, uh, such as me, um, for whom the violence of terrorism, of narco-terrorism, uh, the bombs that were being placed um, in, in very sensitive places by Pablo Escobar and the Cartel de Medellin. Uh, these were, uh, uh, this kind of unpredictable violence was, you know, filtrating to our private lives. And I tried to explore that in that story. So it's a book in which many stories have a lot to do with the fact that I arrived in Colombia at this particular moment in time in 2012, in which uh, 
a, a big national conversation was going on. And the conversation was, how do we stop the cycles of violence? Or how do we tell stories about the violence that we have experienced for the last half a century? All the questions turned around this thing that was happening to us, the peace negotiations. And naturally, they were part of what I was writing too. And uh, in the first story, on the first page, uh, you give a very important point, or rather your narrator. And uh, I do confess that I was instantly in love with, with the book on that very page in um, Women at the Riverbank, which you just mentioned. Uh, because first of all, on the very first page, I think even in the first paragraph, your narrator firstly talks about the right of telling somebody's story. Now, what yes. you just mentioned, needs a society uh, that could possibly heal again, um, telling people stories is um, possibly the, the most important and the most crucial thing to do. He says, uh, your narrator, he says that a story is the territory of only that individual person and no one else is allowed to touch it. Retelling the story, and I'm looking at my notes because I want to put this quite precisely, retelling yes. the story without consent is worse than revealing a secret. It is almost like treason. Now in Colombia, as we have various initiatives, we'll come back to that later, um, of people who try to come to terms with the history and the wounds of the country. Um, at the same time, uh, stories of many people need to be told, also the stories of people who are dead or who simply disappeared, no one knows what, what happened to them, and who cannot give their consent to somebody telling the story, and yet you need those stories to help the, the, the hurt society to move forward again and to heal. Now, um, how can you as a writer solve this contradiction? And of course, it's literature versus um, written history as a science. This is quite clear, but, but how do you deal as a human, but also as a writer with that contradiction in telling the, the, the stories? Yeah. Yes, yes, that's, that's quite true. There, there is a, a, a kind of tension there. Um, you know, when I was, uh, when the, the peace referendum was about to take place in Colombia, I talked to one of the chief uh, negotiators on the part of the government. Um, his name is Humberto de la Calle. He's one of the few decent, uh, uh, decent people in Colombian politics right now. Um, and he told me that one of the things that worried him the most was the need to open a space in which we could hear to everybody's stories, in which the stories of everybody who had been through the Colombian uh, conflict could be listened to. Um, and I, I, I realized at that time that this huge task fell on the shoulders of storytellers. I mean, novelists and journalists and historians, our big responsibility was to create a space in which uh, all the stories of the people who had lived through the Colombian conflict could be heard and could have a certain kind of value. Because you only have to look close um, to the, uh, closer to the, uh, to the Colombian conflict as you do in any conflict to realize that versions vary. And uh, the Colombian war told by a victim of the right-wing paramilitaries is not the same war as uh, told by a victim of the Marxist guerrillas or by a victim of state crimes. And the war told by um, somebody, by a, an inhabitant of the big cities is not the same war as the one told by somebody who lives in the rural areas and the poorest areas in Colombia. And so uh, the, this thing we call the past and our understanding of the past is only possible if we allow all those different stories to exist. Where do they exist? This is the big question. Well, one of the places where they exist is literature. Novels, short stories, fiction, imaginative writing, 
are one of the places where all these stories can become important, can become, um, can earn a kind of existence and a kind of permanence on the page. Otherwise, they would be forgotten. Uh, with this in mind, I have, I have talked to people. I have gathered, uh, you know, uh, testimonies. Um, uh, talk to witnesses of violence and try to remember the ways in which I have personally lived through, um, you know, the 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 consequences of the war, uh, and giving all those experiences a place in my fiction has been my own modest way to to um, to open up that space in which as many stories as possible can be told about our violence. There is, there is a great uh, essay by an Argentine writer called Ricardo Piglia, in which he says that if we were able, he remembers this short story by Borges in which a character accepts Shakespeare's memory. It's a fantasy story in which a character is offered Shakespeare's memory, and the only thing he has to do to acquire Shakespeare's memory is say, yes, I want, I want this, I want to. So at that, at that moment, magically, he gets every experience, every image, every memory that once belonged to Shakespeare. And uh, Ricardo Piglia says, if by a similar mechanism, each one of us could acquire every story that is being told in our societies, the, the knowledge of our societies would be much greater than any kind of uh, statistic uh, documents or uh, essay on economics or political reflection or uh, sociologic uh, um, essay. The stories we tell in a society are the place where something resembling truth can probably exist. And so this is what uh, we try to do as, as, as storytellers, to open up that, that space where every version of a very complicated reality um, can exist so that we approach a certain kind of truth. It's not the complete truth, but it's a start. And you just ma mentioned uh, this saying yes to, in that case, to Shakespeare's memory. And this is an incredibly beautiful and relieving step, but also a very heavy, heavy one, a very often painful one. It reminds me of a radio program um, we heard in a German TV um, radio station, SWR2, a cultural station. We talked about this before. Um, it was running exactly in, in this week and it talked about the various initiatives that um, are being established in Colombia exactly to do what, what you also described or one part yes. of that movement um, to come to terms also with the wounds of the various wars um, and uh, they've, uh, they founded committees for remembrance um, and truth commissions and yes. I'd just like to name briefly what's uh, going on there because uh, it also gives a different light on, on your um, mentioning the, the storytellers. Um, and also also shows the uh, the commitment and the, the big um, say uh, mental power or power of soul that's behind that. Uh, this program talked about um, a priest uh, in a rural area somewhere, El Castillo, who's very active uh, to name all the individual people who are either dead or disappeared um, and retell their their story. And the very interesting thing is, and this also reminded me of structure of your stories. Um, that they have like representatives of the people um, they want to remind us of. And uh, then a person starts um, to tell in the first person. So they say, I, I'm Ricardo or something, I lived here and there, and this was my job, and my children did this and that. And after a oh. while, the kind of storyteller switches into third person and then uh, describes the fate of that person. Um, and the, int the intention is uh, to make these kind of invisible persons visible again. And a very yes. touching moment was where, when, when the names are called, the, the listeners answer with the word presente, meaning 
uh, the people are present in our hearts. This yes. is very, very touching. And um, it reminded me of some of your stories when uh, past and present flow into one, which is also um, an experience um, people do that have a, a traumatic experience that uh, suddenly various levels of time flow into one. Yes, quite true. Well, it's, it's beautiful what you were just telling about and quite true. Um, yes, the, the past is, is a very big presence again in my, in my stories as it is in my novels. Uh, my novels tend to be about somebody who tries to rediscover or maybe discover for the first time something that happened in the past. Um, in these stories, it's often the case that a, a character is, um, a character carries out an investigation into the past. It might be his own past or somebody else's past, but they are investigations that, uh, um, whose um, initial point is that the past is uh, a difficult place that uh, that is constantly that really never goes away is, is the big problem for my characters the past never goes away um i've often quoted william faulkner a writer that is important for an american writer uh, who is important for uh, south american writers um who writes in one of his novels that the past is not dead, it's not even past. So what he's saying is that the past remains with us. The past is a kind of uh, a fourth dimension of the present. Um, we live much more so, I think, in some societies than others. But um, as a general rule, we all live with the presence of the past with us, with the ghosts of the past. And the past can be uh, history or the, the, the private past of our families, um, or as in the case of, of the characters in the novel, in, in the short stories, it's something mysterious, something difficult um, that happened to us uh, that for some reason, is back in our present lives. Um, this is the case, for instance, with a character uh, from a short story called Frogs, which is one of my favorites in the book. Um, he is a veteran of the Korean War. Uh, Colombia sent a, um, a body of people to the Korean, to the Korean War in 1950-1953. Um, and there's this veteran, many years later, who is having a celebration about the fact that, you know, uh, 50 years have gone by since the, the Korean War, etc. And during that celebration, he meets somebody that he has met before. And that uh, chance meeting just brings a very uncomfortable secret to the present moment. Um, and again, to prove that the past has this very nasty quality of never going away. It's always there bothering us. And this is what happens to that character. It, it, it's all over the place in, in the stories. This thing we call the past, it's all over the place. It never goes away. It, he, it keeps haunting these characters. And in many of the stories, uh, what the reader finds, what you will find as readers, is a kind of investigation. The, the, the characters are carrying out an investigation into a mystery that is set in the past, um, in the past of the characters. Uh, this is something that I that I like to do with my stories uh, very much. Probably because I like to do, I like to read about these uh, these characters that are in constant tension with the past and always trying to investigate a little bit more about the secrets and the mysteries and the ghosts that they have left behind. 
And the mystery is also in the middle of uh, the, the story we'll read in a couple of minutes. And um, it's not very far in the past, just a couple of days for the characters in the story. Yeah. But we'll start uh, with it uh, now. Uh, the story is called We. And uh, you will start uh, with uh, a short passage in Spanish and I'll take over and read uh, the first part from the beginning again in German. Thank you. So the story is called in Spanish, Nosotros. I will read the first paragraph so that you get a sense of the music uh, and the original language. Dos días después de la desaparición, cuando en las redes empezaron a circular las preguntas inquietas de su ex esposa, los amigos estuvimos de acuerdo en que Sandoval, tras despedirse de nosotros, se había ido a buscar a su nueva novia, una veinteañera incombustible de tobillos tatuados con la que llevaba saliendo unos cuantos meses, y no era improbable que la noche se hubiera ido de madre, se hubiera salido de madre, y hubiera terminado en algún hotel indulgente, entre botellas de ron vacías y pies desnudos que las patean y fantasmas de cocaína en las mesas de vidrio. Sus amigos le conocíamos esos excesos, los tolerábamos y a veces los juzgábamos, hipócritamente, pues todos habíamos participado en ellos alguna vez. Pero en las redes se hizo evidente muy pronto que nadie lo había visto, ni la nueva novia, ni su madre, ni sus vecinos, y el último testimonio con que se contaba era el del taxista que lo había esperado a primera hora de la mañana frente a un banco del norte, la puerta amarilla abierta como un ala y el motor encendido, mientras Sandoval sacaba de un cajero más billetes de los que parecía aconsejable llevar encima en nuestra ciudad acosadora. Se pensó que lo habían secuestrado, se habló de paseo millonario y tuvimos que imaginar a Sandoval recorriendo la ciudad y sacando de los cajeros todo lo que pudieran darle sus tarjetas generosas. Y luego regresando a pie, aterrado pero a salvo, desde algún potrero insondable del río Bogotá. Las redes nos trajeron mensajes de solidaridad o de ayuda, descripciones de Sandoval, estatura de 1,80, pelo muy corto de canas prematuras y buenos deseos redactados con palabras que no eran optimistas, cierto, pero todavía no eran luctuosas. Y sin embargo, ya algunos sugerían una escena en que sus asaltadores siguen a Sandoval desde el banco, esperando que se quede solo, y le roban el dinero y el reloj y el celular antes de pegarle un tiro en la frente. That's it. Gracias. So, I resume from the beginning in, in German. Via. Zwei Tage nach seinem Verschwinden, als in den sozialen Netzwerken beunruhigte Fragen seiner Ex-Frau zu zirkulieren begannen, gingen wir Freunde davon aus, dass Sandoval, nachdem er sich von uns verabschiedet hatte, zu seiner neuen Freundin gefahren war, einer unermüdlichen Mitzwanzigerin mit tätowierten Knöcheln, mit der er sich seit ein paar Monaten traf. Und bestimmt war die Nacht aus dem Ruder gelaufen und hatte in irgendeinem freimütigen Hotel geendet, zwischen leeren Rumflaschen, nach denen nackte Füße traten und gespenstischen Fährten von Kokain auf den Glastischen. Wir Freunde wussten von seinen Exzessen, tolerierten sie, verurteilten sie manchmal, heuchlerisch, denn alle hatten wir schon daran teilgenommen. Aber in den Netzwerken erfuhr man schnell, dass niemand ihn gesehen hatte, weder die neue Freundin noch seine Mutter oder die Nachbarn. Zuletzt hatte ihn ein Taxifahrer gesehen, der früh morgens vor einer Bank im Norden gewartet hatte, die gelbe Tür wie ein Flügel gespreizt mit laufendem Motor, während Sandoval mehr Scheine aus dem Geldautomaten zog, als in unserer lauernden Stadt ratsam ist. Man dachte an eine Entführung, sprach vom Paseo Millonario, der Geldautomatentour, und wir stellten uns vor, wie Sandoval in der Stadt die Runde machte, alles auf den Automaten zog, was seine großzügigen Kreditkarten hergaben, und dann zu Fuß zurückkehrte, zu Tode erschrocken, aber in Sicherheit, von einem leeren Grundstück im Nirgendwo am Rio Bogota. Die Netzwerke füllten sich mit Nachrichten der Solidarität und des Beistands, mit Beschreibungen Sandowals, Größe 1,80, kurzgeschorenes Haar mit früh ergrauten Strähnen, und guten Wünschen in nicht gerade optimistischen Worten, mag sein, aber noch nicht im Trauermodus. Dennoch malten sich manche schon eine Version aus, bei der die Angreifer Sandoval von der Bank aus folgten, abwarten, bis er allein ist 
und ihm dann Geld, Uhr und Handy abnehmen, bevor sie ihn in die Stirn schießen. Alicia Sandovals Ex-Frau sorgte sich von Anfang an besonders intensiv oder zumindest öffentlicher, als wir erwartet hätten. Die beiden hatten sich an der Universität kennengelernt, kurz bevor Sandoval das Studium aufgab. Und in ihrer Ehe hatte ein latentes Ungleichgewicht geherrscht, da sie den Ton anzugeben schien. Von ihr war der Vorschlag gekommen, Sandoval sollte ein Finanzberatungsunternehmen gründen. Sie hatte ihn in einem Gemeinschaftsbüro untergebracht, um Kosten zu sparen. Und Sandoval überzeugt, das staubige Ambiente sei nicht nachteilig, denn die Schreibtische mit den Glasplatten der Geruch nach Möbelpolitur spiele keine Rolle, wenn die Leute das Geld, das Büro, mit mehr Geld verließen als beim Betreten. Wir hatten immer das Gefühl gehabt, Alicia habe etwas Besseres verdient als Sandoval. Und eben deshalb waren die ersten Stunden nach seinem Verschwinden erschütternd. Sie, so viel stärker, bodenständiger und tatkräftiger als er, sorgte sich mit all dem Elan ihrer Traurigkeit um einen Kerl wie unseren Freund, der nicht zu fassen war, schlüpfrig, stets in Bewegung, als wäre jemand hinter ihm her. Da erfuhren wir, dass die Geldscheine ihre Empfänger erreicht hatten. Mit dem Geld sind wir bezahlt worden, sagte später, als die Verhöre begannen, seine letzte Sekretärin. Gegen halb acht war die Frau zur Arbeit erschienen und hatte die Umschläge mit den Namen der elf Angestellten vorgefunden. Ordentlich adressiert in der Handschrift des Chefs, diese umkippende Schrift, als bliese ihr der Wind ins Gesicht. Dann stellte sich heraus, dass Sandoval ihnen nicht nur den laufenden Monat bezahlt hatte, sondern auch die beiden folgenden. Und sogleich verbreitete sich im Netz die Ansicht, er habe eine Entscheidung getroffen, wenn man auch nicht wusste, welche. Was von dem Moment an geschehen war, dem Moment des Geldautomaten, wie er rasch getauft wurde, lag ebenfalls im Dunkeln. Alicia hielt uns über die Ermittlungen auf dem Laufenden, über die Strafanzeigen vor gelangweilten, blutjungen Polizisten, über die vergebliche Suche in Kranken- und Leichenschauhäusern und auch über die Angst der kleinen Marlena, die alles mitbekam und heimlich unter ihrer Tulpendecke weinte. Und wir, wir schrieben uns Nachrichten tief in der Nacht, wollten uns einfach nur Gesellschaft leisten. Schlaflos vor Ungewissheit. So, this is the first part of a story that deals uh, with the past in a very particular way. Because first of all, we don't have um, a specific narrator. We have a group of friends, that's the we, um, who actually remain anonymous, who speak with one voice, but The perspective is not exactly their eyes, um, but the per perspective is delivered to the reader through social networks and, and through the various messages they exchange, what we hear from the police slightly, what they hear, what uh, Sandoval's ex-wife is doing and so on. And interestingly, um, no one stan stands up and looks for him. They're just waiting. They track the posts, but that's it. They believe the web. And that's an interesting turn in your perspective, because uh, as we had just talked about what is the past and how can you find out what has happened. And I, I just have this brief memory of the famous film Rashomon of, um, by Akira Kurosawa, of which you have only various versions yes. of the story. So here you've got the version of the web and of many different platforms in the web. And what's yes. happening? So we, that they have to make sense of all this and, well, yes, th exactly. don't really manage. Or do they manage? What do you think? I've, I've read the story a number of times and I've read it three times at least and I've read it differently every time. And of course, I try to solve the mystery and I must say I didn't really manage to. That's <laughs> good. I think that's, that's the good. point. <laughs> that is the point. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there was this one of my favorite short story writers who is kind of a, a, a forefather figure uh, to many of us who love short stories as a genre is Anton Chekhov, the Russian short story writer, uh, who in the same way as Borges owes his reputation in the history of literature to short stories. This is the genre in which he worked and this is the genre in which he left 
um, uh, incredible things for us. Um, and um, in, there is a letter uh, that he writes to one of his readers, one of his critics, who uh, has written before to say, well, you know, Mr. Chekhov, you don't give us any clear philosophy of life with your short stories. You don't tell us who is right and who is wrong. You don't, um, you don't assume a moral position um, in your literature. And Anton Chekhov says, you are confusing two things. First, um, answering a problem, solving a problem, and then stating the problem correctly. And he says only the second is required of an artist. So this is something that I believe. Um, the, the, the role of literature is not to answer questions. The role of literature is to uh, uh, formulate the, the questions correctly, to present the problem to the reader. And this is what this short story tries to do, we. It tries to formulate a problem for the reader. Um, everything you said before, Yuta, is exactly accurate. It's a question of, about who is telling this story and what story are, uh, are these people telling? And how, we, how do we get to the, to the bottom of this story? There is a mystery in the story. What has happened to this guy, to this Sandoval, who has disappeared? Where has he gone? Why? Why did he want to disappear from his life? Um, these are the questions. What the story tries to ask readers to reflect about is the participation of social media as this, this enormous storytelling presence in our lives. This is something that has worried me for a very long time. For many, many years, I have tried to think about the implications and the consequences of um, the power social media has among us as a storyteller. Um, we seem to live in a narrative created by social media. It's no longer power. Uh, a government, a state, uh, or even, you know, the, the power of traditional media. Um, it's no longer these, these forces who shape our narrative, who shape the story we live in. It's social media. And, uh, and you know, it's, uh, it's a source of anxiety for me uh, because of what I'm seeing in the world. Um, there are political impl implications, of course, uh, social and political implications that are there for us to see. They're very evident for anybody who wants to see them. But there's also personal implications. Uh, there's also a, a, a way in which um, the stories we tell in social media can end up invading our private lives. Um, there's, again, Chekhov. There's a beautiful story by Chekhov that I, I urge you all to read called The Lady with the Lab Dog or, or The Lady with the Little Dog, depending on the translation. La Señora del Perrito uh, in Spanish. Yes, thank you. And there's one single line in that story, um, very brief, in which the narrator just says uh, in passing, um, the narrator says that there is, there is this character, the main character is having an affair with a married woman. He himself is married. And at some point he realizes he doesn't even want to tell his friends about the secret. Because, says the narrator, often what is secret is what is most valuable in our lives. Our, our secrets... The things we don't want to talk about are the things that are most important for us. Um, this is, among many other things, I mean, among many other ways of reading this idea, uh, there is a strong 
vindication of privacy, uh, the importance of our private lives. And one of my big preoccupations about um, these new technologies that we have been living with in the last 15 years, 10 years, 15 years, is this war, this open war waged against privacy. And, um, and it's, uh, it worries me. And I think part of that is behind the story we, but it's only part of that. You know, the story manages to do other things at the same time. And this is why it can be, um, it can be, it can give you many different answers uh, or rather no answers at all, but an exploration of a certain problem, um, which is that, which is what you found, Yuta. And I'm glad, I'm glad you did. There are um, a couple of other things that, that struck me about that story. Um, as uh, the web is so to speak, um, or the social media, the creator of its own perspective, yes. which is simply um, adopted by the friends of Sandoval, and actually they simply submit under that uh, perspective and it's not even a coherent one. We all know this. You have all kinds of posts and fake news and half fake and uh, intentionally fake news and so on and so forth, conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theories uh, and so on. But it, it seems like uh, there is some truth in it. And of course, they are looking for their friend. They are just snapping at everything that, that could help to, to, to uh, solve the, uh, the mystery. But of course, you have different levels of facts and truths in there, which is one of the main problems also of, of the web, um, independent of the problem of privacy, which you just mentioned. But uh, something else also struck me, because actually they become inactive. They believe that the net can solve it all. And in the end, yes. I, I kept asking myself, why don't you just stand up and look for him? Then later we will uh, read the, the second part in a couple of minutes. Uh, you will see, um, He's at the airport, so why don't you try to find out? So they wait for the net to present them some kinds of pretend, pretext or solutions. Yeah. And uh, in the end, um, now we will say that after we, we've read the, the second part, otherwise it's a spoiler. Okay. Shall we go to the second part then? What do you think? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, let's. So again, I will read the mm -hmm. next uh, paragraph in Spanish, and then Yuta will read that paragraph and the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. In German. Al tercer día, después de la desaparición, las meticulosas redes nos trajeron una noticia que confirmó las sospechas más viles. Sandoval había salido del país. La presión de los trinos acabó por llegar a los oídos correctos y una revista caritativa reveló en internet unas imágenes de calidad precaria, en las cuales Sandoval o alguien muy parecido a Sandoval se acercaba a la ventanilla de emigración y levantaba la cabeza como para hacer chasquear los huesos del cuello mientras el funcionario le sellaba el pasaporte. Nunca sabremos si llegó a creer en algún momento que de verdad podía pasar desapercibido, pero es muy probable que haya sido así, porque de otra manera hubiera tomado más precauciones para esconderse. En las redes comenzó pronto una discusión entre dos bandos. Si Sandoval estuviera fugándose de algo, decían unos, habría disimulado, se habría escondido, habría llevado un saco con capucha o una gorra de béisbol o un sombrero vallenato o al menos unas gafas oscuras para hurtar el rostro a las cámaras impertinentes y ubicuas. Que no lo hubiera hecho, sostenían los otros, no era sino la prueba de que se creía y siempre se había creído por encima de la ley. Un intocable, un dueño de todo, un miembro de esa clase que había crecido con la convicción profunda de que el país era su finca y ellos eran los capataces. Eso es. That's it. Go ahead. Eine Nachricht, die die bösartigsten Verdächtigungen bestätigte. Sandoval hatte das Land verlassen. Das Tweetgezwitscher hatte schließlich die richtigen Ohren erreicht und eine barmherzige Zeitschrift stellte ein paar Videos von zweifelhafter Qualität ins Netz, auf denen Sandoval oder jemand, der Sandoval ähnelte, zum Ausreiseschalter ging und dort den Kopf zurücklegte, als wollte er die Nackenwirbel krachen lassen, während der Beamte einen Stempel in den Pass drückte. Wir werden nie erfahren, ob er jemals geglaubt hatte, unbemerkt untertauchen zu können, 
Aber so war es höchstwahrscheinlich, sonst hätte er Vorkehrungen getroffen, sich zu tarnen. In den Netzwerken entbrannte nun ein Streit zwischen zwei Lagern. Wenn Sandoval auf der Flucht gewesen wäre, sagten die einen, hätte er sich verstellt, verhüllt, sich mit einer Kapuzenjacke verkleidet, einer Baseballkappe, mit dem breiten Hut der Vallenato-Sänger oder wenigstens mit einer Sonnenbrille, damit das Gesicht der allgegenwärtigen, zudringlichen Kameras verborgen blieb. Diese Offenheit, führten die anderen ins Feld, war ein Beweis dafür, dass er glaubte und immer geglaubt hatte, über dem Gesetz zu stehen. Ein Unberührbarer. Herr über alles. Teil dieser Klasse, die in der tiefsten Überzeugung aufgewachsen ist, das Land sei ihr Privatanwesen und die anderen die Vorarbeiter. Alicia bat unermüdlich und vergeblich um Respekt. Sie führte an, und wir sahen zu, niemand könne beweisen, dass er etwas Schlimmes getan habe. Und es gebe ja noch immer kein Lebenszeichen von ihm, trotz der Kamerabilder. Die Familie gab daraufhin eine Erklärung ab, nach der Sandoval offiziell weiterhin als vermisst galt, denn obwohl sie mit allen Mitteln versucht hätten, mit ihm in Kontakt zu treten, hätten weder seine Ex-Frau noch Mutter oder Freunde Nachricht erhalten. Noch hat er den Erhalt unserer Nachrichten bestätigt. Manche in den Netzwerken verdammten ihn bereits als rücksichtslos, da er tatenlos zusehe, wie seine Angehörigen vor Angst vergingen. Andere hingegen fragten, was er denn tun solle, wenn er aller Wahrscheinlichkeit nach in einem Kofferraum liege, ein Loch in der Stirn. Die Behörden erwiderten die Erklärung der Familie mit einer eigenen, in der festgestellt wurde, dass Senor Sandoval Guzman am Flughafen El Dorado die Ausreise vollzogen habe, um 7.14 Uhr morgens und mit dem Flug 246 um 2.39 Uhr nachmittags Ortszeit in Washington gelandet sei wenn man auch noch nicht habe überprüfen können, ob er am internationalen Flughafen Dals die Einreiseformalitäten absolviert habe, aber sobald man es erfahre, versicherte barmherzig die Erklärung, werde man sogleich Meldung erstatten. Washington? Aus welchem Grund hätte Sandoval nach Washington reisen sollen? Niemals, soweit unsere Erinnerung reichte, hatten wir ihn von Washington als Ziel seiner Geschäfte reden hören. Und Alicia fielen auch keine Freunde oder sonstigen Anlässe dort ein. Binnen Stunden hatten sich in den Netzwerken Gruppen gebildet mit Namen wie Helft Sandoval Guzman in den Vereinigten Staaten oder Have you seen Sandoval Guzman? Man postete Fotos von Männern, die Sandoval glichen. Ratschläge von Kolumbianern, an wen sich wenden, wo suchen, die ihre Erfahrungen als Ansässige im District of Columbia einbrachten. Theorien, die Koma und Amnesie einschlossen, Überfälle mit Skopolamin, dass die Opfer den Kriminellen zu Willen macht, so dass sie sich bewegen, Flugzeuge besteigen und Papiere vorzeigen und niemand merkt, dass sie im eigenen Körper nicht mehr anwesend sind. Jemand sagte, er habe ihn in einem Stadion gesehen. Jemand hatte sich mit ihm an einem Tresen unterhalten. Jemand war mit ihm in einem Bus Richtung Süden gefahren. Und in den Netzwerken sprachen wir von der armen Marlena und stellten Vermutungen darüber an, was ihr durch den Kopf ging, was Alicia auf ihre Fragen antwortet. Und wir fragten uns, wie viel Wahrheit in diesen Gesprächen möglich und wie viel Erfindung nötig war. Aber niemals reagierten wir auf einen anonymen Tweet. Dann hat der Typ noch so ein süßes Mädchen, Manuela heißt sie, da muss man schon ein Scheißkerl sein, wenn man die so einfach verlässt. Nein, niemals reagierten wir darauf, verbesserten auch den Namen nicht. Es waren nur ein paar Buchstaben und hätte zu nichts geführt. Allerdings redeten wir uns ein, dass Marlena erst vier war und das Ganze bald vergessen würde. Obwohl man in den Netzwerken nichts vergaß. All das würde auch in 10, 15 Jahren verfügbar sein und das Mädchen, das dann kein Mädchen mehr wäre, würde es suchen und davon erfahren. Nichts vergisst das Netz. Nur die guten Nachrichten sind flüchtig. Das Befriedigende, die kleinen oder großen Erfolge. Während die Fehler, die Schuld, das Straucheln und die unvorsichtigen Worte, alles, was ein Leben befleckt, immer wach bleiben lauernd und bereit, uns ins Gesicht zu springen. Der Fleck geht nicht fort, wird nie ganz fortgewaschen, so sehr wir ihn verstecken und verheimlichen. 
Er muss nur mit den richtigen Substanzen in Kontakt treten. Und da ist er wieder, auf dem sauberen Stoff unseres Lebens. Die Nachricht wurde nachts in Umlauf gebracht. Wir sahen sie als erstes am Morgen, der für manche mit dem Sonnenaufgang beginnt. Sandoval war tot in einem Hotelzimmer aufgefunden worden, in Jacksonville, Florida. Offenbar, offensichtlich war er mit einem Greyhound-Bus aus Washington gekommen und über Raleigh, Fayetteville und Savannah gefahren, eine 17-stündige Reise mit unbekanntem Ziel. In dem Hotel hatte er sich ein Hamburger und ein Glas Wein kommen lassen, nach dem Essen das Tablett mit den Resten vor die Tür von Zimmer 303 gestellt, dann mit Bleistift den Frühstückstettel ausgefüllt, der vor einer bestimmten Uhrzeit für morgens an der Tür hängen muss, damit der Gast mit seiner Bestellung geweckt wird. Er kreuzte Kaffee und Orangensaft an, ein Spiegelei, sunny side up. In dem Kästchen für die Uhrzeit machte er ein Kreuz bei 7.30 Uhr. Dann legte er sich in Unterhose in T-Shirt unter die Bettdecke und schluckte mit einer Flasche Wasser aus der Minibar eine Röhre Schlaftabletten. Der Fernseher lief, als man ihn fand. Aber niemand wusste, was für eine Sendung er gesehen hatte, bevor er eingeschlafen war. Man wird es erfahren, versteht sich. Am Ende erfährt man alle Einzelheiten. Aber was man immer noch nicht weiß, worüber immer noch diskutiert wird, manchmal in scharfen Worten, die Diskussionen im Netz werden hitzig geführt, das sind die Gründe, aus denen Sandoval dem Leben entfloh. Augenblicklich können wir nur Vermutungen anstellen, wie alle es seitdem tun. Eine millionenschwere Veruntreuung? Beweise für besessene Promiskuität? Werden jetzt Fotos von kleinen Mädchen erscheinen, obszöne Textnachrichten, Bilder von irrigierten Penissen mit Textzeilen, die uns peinlich sein werden? Oder kommen wir vielleicht einer Zwangsordnung auf die Spur, einer nicht wieder gut zu machenden Ungerechtigkeit, den fatalen Resultaten einer ärztlichen Untersuchung? Unanfechtbar wäre ein Urteil. Zumindest darin sind wir uns einig. Sandoval hatte sich in eine Flucht gestürzt. Es zumindest versucht, hatte sich neu erfinden, ein neues Leben beginnen wollen. Hatte verschwinden wollen, um ein anderer zu werden. Ein neuer Mensch. Oder um gar nicht mehr zu sein und keinen zu stören. Was für ein Jammer, dass man ihn nicht rechtzeitig gefunden hat. Denn wir, wir hätten ihn vielleicht retten, ihn überzeugen können, wieder zurückzukehren. Zu uns. That's the end of this story. Thank you. The last sentence um, makes me shiver. Actually, we we could have found we could have helped him if we had found him, but they haven't even searched for him. They they relied on the net, and as you described very very con con convincingly, uh, the net is entirely running wild. And, uh, and then you have all these ideas coming in and a kind of um, also um, looking and longing for the tiny sordid details because that's the scandals that the, the yes. net lives upon. And uh, in the end, they just do nothing and wait. And I wondered, um, isn't also the net with all the commitments it offers, which are also good ways to connect, of course, we know this from yes. Arabellion and so on. But um, isn't it also a seduction to feel committed in a topic, but actually you avoid the, the real personal commitment or the real personal faithfulness? Yeah, well, this is, of course, one of the big questions we have to face right now. I completely agree. Um, in a sense, you can say that, that participating in social media has become a substitute for actual engagement with life, you know? um, in the, the, the phenomenon of what people are calling virtuous indignation is very much with us. The idea that instead of doing something real um, to solve or to collaborate with the solving of a big or small problem, uh, we are, as a society, we are under the illusion that showing our indignation in social media is enough. 
is a good enough substitute for acting? And this is, of course, one of the questions that the, that the short story tries to suggest. Another one, Yuta, I think, is um, allowing the probability that this man did not want to be found, that um, he uh, probably should have the right or would have been given the right to quietly disappear as he wanted. If the machine of uh, social media wasn't set into motion. All these are questions. There are no definite answers with this story. But these are the questions that the story asks readers to think about. Um, and of course, I think there, I mean, the story was written maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, let me think. No, four years ago, almost. But I think it's, it, it speaks about uh, many things that are, are still part of our conversations and our um, preoccupations, right, as, as citizens. So, um, you know, I hope, I hope German citizens uh, will be uh, sensitive to these questions. This also brings us to your seminar at the Freie University in, in Berlin, which you are just doing. Uh, this, the, this is the Samuel Fischer visiting professor, yes. and uh, it touches quite similar questions as we were just uh, discussing. Uh, this is a professorship uh, that's held by international writers who also reflect on their respective cultural contexts. And the title of your seminar is, I'll quote, uh, The Politics of Fiction. Uh, discussions on history, memory, and the possibility of truth. Uh, you'll talk about the novel's position between history and, uh, and fiction, also reflecting on post-truth issues. And I, I do admit that I'm almost a bit envious we can't take part in it here. <laughs> uh, but at least your inaugural lecture um, is online. And uh, I'd just to like to mention this briefly. Um, it'll be on the, the, the whole seminar will be on the net sooner or later in English, so many people can, can listen to it. And your inaugural lecture was a digital dialogue with Alberto Manguel on reading as a way of interpreting one's life. And of course, we, we can't uh, give a summary of your seminar here, and uh, quite apart from the fact that it's still running. Um, but maybe we can just touch one or another topic. Um, we have so many possibilities um, of fake facts uh, nowadays. We've, we know that the deep facts by which we, you can um, change somebody's facial expression and uh, it looks utterly like yes. reality. And actually, this reminds me of George Orwell's 1984 because this is exactly the, the, the job Winston Smith, uh, the, the protagonist, uh, does um, all the time. And I wondered uh, in this um, a very complicated uh, context of different layers of factualness and of truth. What do you see as the strength of literature in this field? I could almost imagine learning about perspective because just in a novel you get so many different perspectives and you learn to differentiate between those so that it might help, help to become more aware of what especially the net presents. But I'd like yeah. to hear your view on this. Yes, well, and that exact question that you have just asked is at the origin of my course. Um, in my terms, what is the place of literature at a moment such as ours? Um, we are living through a very particular moment that we, we wouldn't have been able to, um, to, um, uh, to guess um, 10 years ago, the advent of social media, among other things, and the role that uh, Facebook and Twitter play in our lives as citizens and as individuals, as private individuals, couldn't have been foreseen by anybody. Um, now that we are firmly installed um, in this new way of, um, in this new relationship with the world, mediated by these powerful big tech um, uh, everything that has changed the way we think about democracy, the, the, the way we vote, the way we have our political conversations, but also the way we debate, um, no, rather the way we behave as private individuals, as I was saying, when we know for a fact that we are being spied upon the whole day by our machines, right? 
All these are questions that go to the heart of what we are as human beings. And uh, for someone like me who believes that part of what we are as human beings is inseparable from the discoveries of literature. Uh, what we are as human beings is inseparable from Shakespeare and Cervantes and uh, Montaigne and uh, Goethe. Um, these are the people who have in a way um, uh, taught us to think about what we are as human beings. Uh, George Eliot, Virginia Woolf, uh, um, Hermann Broch, uh, Musil, Proust, and, and then my great Latin American uh, masters, Garcia Marquez and Vargas Llosa and Borges. Um, all these people, Marguerite Yourcenar in uh, writing in French, all these people have given us ways of thinking about what we are as human beings. Now, my question with this course that I'm writing is, what is their place now in our world right now, a world in which we are living in a story told mainly by social media. Um, we are living in a story in which a, a sense of sharing the same reality as our neighbor is no longer there. Um, this is what happened, for instance, on January the 6th at the American Capitol, that a group of people who are living in a story that doesn't correspond to the truth uh, did certain things because they are living in their story. And they think the rest of the people who are not seeing that story are the liars and the um, uh, and the and the uh, and the con men and and the, the ones who are being dishonest. So, in this place, in this time, in which we no longer share the same definition of what is real, because we are living inside bubbles um, uh, fabricated by algorithms through mechanisms that are now very very well known. What is the, the place of fiction? Fiction is, is also a made up story. So what is the place of fiction? Um, how can fiction uh, reconnect us to certain kinds of our humanity that I think are under attack by uh, the way we are, uh, we are behaving right now? Um, for instance, I believe the modern novel was born in the 16th century through an act of empathy, through the curiosity a writer had for the life of another human being who was very different from what he was. And so he writes this fake autobiography, trying to get himself inside the head of another person. Um, and producing a little book in Spanish called Lazarillo de Tormes, which is basically a, a, uh, an aristocrat, an intellectual, a humanist, invading the mind and the consciousness of a poor orphan, almost illiterate, who had nothing in life and telling his story. This is among other things, an act of empathy and curiosity. This to my mind, this is what I'm talking about in the course, is how the modern novel was born. Now, what happens with social media is the contrary. Social media, according to many people who are experts and know much more than me about the, this thing, social media is creating blinders for us, blinders that allow us only to see a story uh, that we agree with. Um, and that is different from the story that our neighbor is seeing. So uh, as Lanier, Jaron Lanier, a, a great um, um, artificial intelligence pioneer, as he says in a little book, what happens here is that uh, the idea of empathy uh, is completely broken. The idea of being able to see the story of someone else 
is broken. The idea of imagining the story of someone else and so the causes that they think are different from me and that they believe different things from me, all that is broken. And it's very serious. It's a huge problem we have right now as societies. Now, in all this, what is the place of fiction? This is what I'm trying to ask my students and this is what I'm trying to think about. And this brings me to another question, uh, which is, uh, which, which is the place and, and the role for writers? I've got a, um, a quote by Amos Oz in my mind, um, who once said in, a, in an award a speech, he said, uh, writers are the fire alarms or fire detectors of language. And uh, of course, when we think of the net, it's not only the content, the wild content, it's also uh, the, the, the language that starts to slip and becomes violent and, uh, and uh, discriminating. Uh, so what do you claim for writers as far as their role in society is concerned? Mm. Also given that, yes. that you have give, uh, um, published many, many political commentaries. Yes, yes, this is, this is a very interesting question. A very interesting question. Well, I. Uh, I do try to separate the writer from the citizen. Um, and um, and I, I'm, I'm always keen to, um, to convey the idea that uh, writers have uh, no obligation but writing the best book they can. The problem is that I don't practice this idea myself. I do believe in the writer as someone who engages with reality, who tries to ask difficult questions, who tries to confront power and, um, uh, and, um, and in, in a sense, uh, try to, to recover for citizens the right to tell their own story. Um, in countries such as mine, it's often uh, the case that uh, what we understand about the past and also about the present, but what we understand about our, our common past is filtered through the version that people in power want to give. And this, of course, again, as 1984 by George Orwell uh, demonstrates perfectly, um, stories, when they are in the hands of uh, political power, they can be changed, they can be distorted, they can be made to say uh, different things that, that uh, are useful for the people in power. One of the possible roles of literature is raising a hand and saying, hey, Things did not happen like that. Um, and so questioning the, the, uh, the, the official version of history um, or confronting history and saying uh, reality is much richer than you are suggesting or much more contradictory or much more difficult to understand or things are not as simple as you are telling us. Um, or these, all these are very legitimate things that literature does. Uh, literature is a place of memory. And um, in countries in which the past is difficult, it's uh, full of suffering and confrontation. Um, well, maybe there will be some people who try to forget what shouldn't be forgotten. Maybe there will be some, some people who try to hide or to suppress what we need to know as a society to move forward. Um, literature, novels are there almost always to say, let's not forget about this. Let's keep talking about these, these people who have suffered, who have been victims, uh, who have gone through very difficult things because once we stop telling their stories, they will forever disappear from the face of the earth. And when the past, um, particularly when it's a difficult past, uh, disappears, then we lose the tools to reflect about our present and our future. And this is a very difficult thing uh, to happen in a society. 
Um, what we are experiencing right now in Colombia is also, as you were suggesting before, is also a debate about the past with these institutions, uh, such as the Commission of Truth, um, a commission created to try to find out what happened in the last 50 years of war. Um, these are storytelling institutions. These are institutions created to try to tell a story or to tell many, many stories. Um, this is one of the beautiful ways in which literature can be engaged with life, with real life, um, and with with uh, the you know the uh, the most the darkest and the most difficult uh, um, areas in our common lives as citizens. Um, literature tries to remember when uh, powerful people try to forget. Literature tries to remember when societies forget, even if they don't want to. Um, literature is there to dispute the monolithic official version of history that is sometimes being handed to us. So I do believe there are uh, noble and beautiful things that uh, novelists and, um, and works of fiction can do to, you know, to, um, uh, to avoid some of the big problems that societies can have. Um, and, uh, you know, even if I do believe it's necessary to separate the writer from the citizen, um, I am personally, I feel personally very engaged with, with, um, with uh, these uh, noble things that literature can do, and they are what I try to do in my novels and short stories. And this personal engagement uh, you just mentioned, is this one of the reasons for your own experience, or maybe even you as a person, appearing much more, uh, in a much more definite way in these stories than before? Probably, probably. It is true. Um, so many of the stories are told by a narrator that readers can identify with myself, um, a narrator who has published, in many cases, the books that I have published, um, who shares my biographical coordinates, let's say. Um, uh, why does that happen, Yuta? I'm not sure, but I do believe your theory is, is close to, to, to being right. These are stories told First, this is probably my most autobiographical book in the sense that every story, in a sense, happened to me. Uh, or either it happened to me, or I saw it happen to somebody, or uh, um, in, in a couple of cases, such as the story of Frogs about this veteran of the Civil War. Um, these are stories that, uh, that I received from their protagonists. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it is, it is a book that tries to explore things that I have lived through or witnessed. Um, at some point, I realized maybe the best strategy to, um, to send you readers uh, this message, the message that these things uh, are important for me because I saw them happen or they happened to me or whatever. Um, the best way to convey this message was to make myself the narrator of the stories, to create a situation in the stories in which uh, the one telling the story is occupies my place. It's kind of a witness um, of the story by somebody else. It is, among other things, a way of responding to the relationship I have with my material. Um, my stories are often born out of curiosity about somebody that I meet. Um, um, such is the story, for instance, uh, called Airport, in which, which is based on a silly, frivolous anecdote, a day that I spent working as an extra for Roman Polanski, um, along with 100 or 200 other people. There was nothing special about that. I was just a teenager and I was paid to spend a day 
uh, as part of the crowd who were working with Roman Polanski for a certain film. Now, mm, this is, as I say, a frivolous anecdote. It, it shouldn't be important, but the thing is, seeing him work um, created in my mind these questions, these uncomfortable questions about the way we deal with violence, uh, violence that uh, we are victims of or violence that we know others are victims of. Um, and I couldn't free myself from these questions um, other than by writing the story. So it, in a way, all the stories work similarly. They are, they, their, their original, uh, I'm sorry, their original impulse is something that happened to me, a direct experience. And the stories are my way of thinking about the implications of this experience um, and trying to, to, um, to find in these experiences, in these people that I have met over the years, something that is viol valuable for all of us, something that has universal uh, importance and that deals with universal emotions so that anybody can find something of value in the retelling and the re-examination of that anecdote. And in the story Airport, you also go deep, more deeply into the topic of empathy, which you just mentioned earlier. Yes. It's also a uh, story that comes very close uh, to the reader. But I just saw, we got a question uh, that touches uh, the, the story we read, we, and I'll just read it to you. Please explain the choice of the name Sandoval, which has an original meaning in Castilian and has a bodyguard of a president of Colombia and of a football player. <laughs> so how did that um, come about? Well, um, thank you for those insights. But in fact, mm, the, the reasons these names usually come to me um, have a lot to do with how they sound. Uh, in Colombia, as in many other places, a particular name will give you a, a direct idea of what this character is like, where does it come from, what part of the country in many cases, um, as you probably know. Um, in, the, in this case, it's, it's a name that had a certain rhythm, a certain music uh, that I needed. And it also conveyed a person uh, from the interior of the country. Um, I know this because it, it just happens that it is in my family. Uh, there, there's a, a grandfather of mine, his second family name was Sandoval. So um, since the story takes place in, in Bogota, I wanted the name to, you know, be believable uh, as for a person that comes from the center of the country, from the interior of the country. Um, and it also had the music that I needed. Um, the, this, is, this is very difficult to explain, but um, part of the choice in names is sometimes you need a name that has two syllables, sometimes three, um, sometimes four, as um, the, the name of the protagonist of a previous novel of mine called reputations uh, is called Mayarino. I just needed that name to have four syllables because of the particular music, um, not only of the sentences that I was writing, but also of the other names that are surrounding him in the anecdotes of the novel. So, um, yeah. Thank you. There are lots and lots of other things we could uh, still talk about and go on about for a long time, but I'm coming to my last question. Okay. And uh, this has to do originally with your thesis. Um, you graduated in law and your thesis is entitled Revenge as a Legal Prototype in the Iliad. Yes, imagine that. This is really a wonderful topic and I'd very much like to, to, to read your results on that. Now, coming back to Colombia, um, 
where a kind of reprocessing has started, mental and um, coming to terms with the past. Um, of course, it's a very human desire to take revenge and in the hope that revenge helps you to come to terms. I think the psychologists will uh, confirm that this mostly doesn't help as far as, as far, uh, to, to my knowledge. Um, but if we think of the many disappeared people and killed people, of, of the many tragedies that uh, happened in families, um, how do we think, can we, maybe also by literature, counteract that desire that might be, may be in people to take revenge? And how can, can we start um, getting in a kind of healing mode slowly and sensitively? Yes, yeah. yes. Large yes, question, very good question. No, no, it's very good. And of course, the, a proper answer would probably take weeks because this okay. is one of the most interesting and the most difficult questions to to ask when you're trying to um, to reflect on a long history of violence. Uh, of course, what happens with a history of violence as long as, as uh, my country has is that what you see when you examine that history of violence is the enormous ability of violence to reinvent itself. Yeah. The, the endless cycles of revenge and retaliation um, that seem justified at each particular moment. In the large context, you, only, you, you can only perceive how violence breeds nothing but violence. Um, this is what we have been witnessing for the last 70 or 80 years in my country. But it's very difficult to explain this. Um, it, it seems to me very strange how I wrote that, that thesis when I was, uh, I think, what was it, 22 or 23 years old, uh, already thinking in terms of the Iliad about the, the usefulness of violence and um, already um, uh, already learning through the Iliad, uh, the first work of Western literature, how, uh, how violence doesn't give anything. I mean, revenge, uh, vengeance doesn't lead to anything good, doesn't lead to any kind of um, permanent satisfaction. Um, the big question with uh, what we are trying to do in Colombia right now is how to end the cycles of violence. Uh, and to my mind, one of the ways is knowledge. And what I mean by knowledge is knowledge about the other. And this is something that literature is very well suited to do. Literature gives us knowledge about the other human being um, in a way that we can, uh, we can try to understand those who are different from us, those who think different and have different reasons to act as they have. And this investigation into the other uh, can, with any luck, can turn uh, an enemy into just uh, an ideological opposition. Um, and so the other ceases to be an enemy who is a threat to us and becomes just somebody who has led a different life and so thinks and sees the world in, in a different way. Uh, you were quoting Amos Oz before. Uh, Amos Oz has written very beautiful essays about, and also David Grossman in, in Israel, um, very beautiful essays about, about this mechanism, how, um, how the effort to imagine somebody else can be the best recipe for um, neutralizing violence, because when we imagine where the other comes from, uh, when we imagine their lives, their, their emotions, their moral realities, we immediately understand a little bit more about them. 
Um, and uh, this is an antidote to intolerance and bigotry and hatred uh, and fanaticism. Uh, Amos Oz says, imagination uh, is, is the only way to, uh, he says this with better words, but to destroy fanaticism of any kind. And I think probably this is one of the things that, that literature can afford, right? Uh, reading novels is, after all, a way of penetrating the moral and the emotional reality of somebody not like us. So hopefully, Colombian writers will be in the next few years telling us stories about people that we didn't know before, uh, that we considered our enemies, and that after, after their stories are told and known, we will, uh, we will not consider them enemies any longer, uh, but just people who are different from us. So let's hope that happens in a way. And this is a wonderful image of openness towards each other and also of hope, not only for the Colombian, but also for other societies. We know the ones who have had a decade long history of violence and of conflicts. And I thank you so much for creating this image of hope and for holding so many flaming speeches for literature today. Thank you very much, Juan Gabriel Vasquez, for being with us. Thank you for the people at the computers at home and listening to us. It was a great joy to have you here. And I hope we'll see you again soon and in person. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Yuta. It was a pleasure for me to be here. And I thank you all for being here too. Thank you. And a good evening to all of us. Thank you very much again.